one of the most flattering things ever to me was pro- ever, because I have so much admiration for you. In my career was You got your perspective. I just wanna be happy, don't you wanna be happy? Hey everybody, it's Gary Vaynerchuk and I continue playing around with an interview format of just interesting people who are doing interesting things. And today, one of my favorite entrepreneurs, and I'm excited to say that because I have a very funny feeling uh, the millions of people over the next five decades that listen to this or watch this video or listen to this podcast will, will be intrigued by me stating my fav- one of my favorite entrepreneurs when I'm talking about really one of the great music icons of my generation one of the great songwriters, one of the great band members, one of the great music personalities. Frank Tedder is with me today. I think we'll talk about a bunch of stuff, including our love affair with our great friend, Eitan Shugerman. Um, but, but more importantly, uh, I'm gonna try some new things on this format, I decided, because I love Ryan's business brain. And we're gonna talk about some current events and different things, um, and really just how humans work. Because I think when you're a songwriter uh, at his scale, just knowing what humans will be touched by is a skill. It's, I, I feel like I have it in certain ways. I feel like others that I observe have it. And I think um, Ryan has it at the highest level. So Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Gary. How, how do you, when people actually, it's funny that I said that, when somebody like literally is on a plane, oh, here's a good one, you get on a plane, you know, um, and you're just flying and somebody looks sitting next to you, just nice cordial combo, you're about to take off and she or he just says, hey, so what do you do? How do you answer that? That's a really interesting question. Um, I do get asked that on occasion and I say, I typically say I'm in a little bit of this, a little bit of that is my first answer. And because if if I get into what I do specifically, I kind of give them phases to see, am I gonna engage this conversation? How far am I gonna go? Right, when you say that, when you say that, some people may just clam up and pay. This guy's got t- tattoos on his arms. Maybe he's doing something shady or maybe like, like <laughs> you'll, it'll, it'll, you'll see how, if they want to double click into that. Correct. I see if they want to double click the ad, right? So um, I kind of, I'm very nice, very cordial on airplanes. Um, and I've had some phenomenal conversations, but if they go further than I say, I'm in, uh, I'm in music. What do you, oh, what do you do? Well, I'm a songwriter. I'm also a recording artist. Um, and I, you know, I, when you I just, add the, when you add the record, if you, if it's funny, this is so interesting how life works. If you kind of have some work to do or you're tired or not feeling great or just don't want to engage, you may go all the way. You may hold off the recording artist part, right? Because correct. if you just say songwriter, you can kind of wrap up and move on. The second yeah. you go to a recording artist, like, Oh, who are you? Yep. Correct. A hundred percent. And and a lot of times what happens though on airplanes, um, I'm not like that. I'm at that kind of comfortable level of notoriety or, celebrity where I get noticed like in LA or New York or wherever, maybe once or twice a day I get stopped. Right. Um, and they're usually very respectful, very cool. When I'm in an enclosed airplane for six hours or whatever it is, that's, I'm not trying to get stopped. <laughs> you know what I mean? And this, and the, the, the flight attendants very often know who I am. And so that will kind of tee it off, but more or less, you're right. I try to see how far do you want to go down this road? I leave out the recording artists. I, I focus on songwriting and a lot of times I have great conversations because people are fascinated about songwriting. They don't understand it. So yeah, it's, I've had, I've had that conversation more times than I can count. When did you consider your, when did you know you wanted to be a songwriter and why? I knew I wanted to be a songwriter in 1994, 95, when I found out that there was a guy named Babyface hmm. that was writing all these boys to men records on bended knee and like into the road. And then I discovered Diane Warren. Um, mm. And once I discovered that. Up to, how, old, how old were you? I apologize. How old I were was, you? I was mid nineties. I was 14. 14. And, and this was the first time you're like, wait, there's humans that do that. The person that's singing it isn't necessarily writing it. Yep. Oh, that's neat. That was the equivalent of being eight and finding out Santa Claus wasn't real because for most people, they assume that their artists and to to some extent, like bands, very often bands write their own material. That's a very like, you know, exclusive club. But once I discovered that a lot of my favorite records were written by three or four people, um, it was like, oh my God, that is the coolest job of all time. Because 
you get the access, but you don't necessarily have to be front facing. Um, and so then I, yeah, I, I dove headfirst into songwriting, but as I was doing that, I knew I wanted to be an artist. I knew I wanted to sing my own material. And so I was concurrently developing my voice and playing guitar, piano, drums, bass. I, I was an only child, so I had nothing but time. And Were either your parents musical? My dad was a gospel songwriter in the mm. 70s. Um, all throughout this, pretty much the majority of the decade of the 70s, he toured, he opened up for, um, you know, Elvis back in the day. He opened up, and not him, but like his group. He opened up for a lot of huge artists in the, um, in the 70s, and he wrote quite a few gospel records. So yeah, cool. he didn't pursue music, but that, he had that window of time where he was about to, and then he didn't, he didn't take the jump at the end of the day. Did he regret that? Yes. <laughs> he did would that, tell you. Did that, yeah. did that stick with you it, did that become a real i love that you know i talk so much about regret yeah. and i think when people are fortunate enough to have someone they have a good relationship with and they love and loves them if they're able to take the best parts of seeing someone they love have regret it becomes an incredible potion to patience correct correct you're 100 percent right and i i knew that he was less than thrilled with himself for, uh, he got offered a publishing deal, songwriter deal in LA with a very famous uh, producer back in the seventies. And he just recently gotten married and long story short, it was like that. Were you, were you already on the way or not yet? Um, I was not on the way. I think I was like, they were in the plan thinking. They were thinking about you were it. In your parents, you were in your parents' minds. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And my dad went to school and was in a group with Kathy Lee Gifford and she, this is wild. This is why I'm not so cool. making this up. Right? <laughs> Good. And she ended up with a deal, a record deal with CBS Records and ended up, I mean, she had stars in her eyes from day one. Yes, she did. And my dad, and my dad wrote all of her albums, like, like two albums in a row. He wrote all the material. So he was kind of on that bandwagon headed West and it didn't go that way. So for me, I. And because did he think it was the right thing to do to not take high risk? Was he a little fear? Like, did yeah. he, what, what was his makeup? Did you extract that of him? Was he? I would say, I mean, see, yes. So uh, fear-based. I'm from a very religious upbringing, Christian, Pentecostal, Oral Roberts. Like, I see. To this day, my parents and and, and uh, lots of aunts and uncles are very entrenched in. Like, I see. I yeah. see. And so Got you it. understand that paradigm. Now I understand. It is a fear-based decision make. Like, don't don't. 100%. You know, you're 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 getting married. I mean, I'm not making this up. You're getting. They would say like an MRS degree, like get a Mrs. degree, like by spring or else, you know. And yeah. so you've got people getting married at 22 so they can have sex because they've literally been virgins their whole life. There's right. a lot. Of, right. A lot of. Um, by the way, by the way, that was, very, you know, I, you know, it's so funny. I, I was born in communist Russia where religion <laughs> is banned, all of them. Yep. But everybody got married really young yeah. for the same reasons. It was culturally in the yeah. 70s, more like the U.S. in the 20s in Russia. And so you just didn't have sex out of wedlock. And when you're 18, 19 and those hormones are running, it's like I was literally born nine months, one day short of nine months to the day of my parents' wedding night. Wow. My parents got ma married on February 15th and I was wow. born on November 14th. <laughs> <laughs> that is wild. I mean, more or less, that's, that's where I'm, that's what I came from. I get it. And, um, I get it. My uncle, uh, who are still missionaries, funny enough, they actually moved to communist Russia. Um, they lived there in the eighties before, you know, uh, that was a thing. Came down. yeah, that was, they, 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 had, they were followed by the KGB. They were handing out Bibles and secret churches. Um, so I'm I'm with you there, and so that if you understand that paradigm, that that kind of religious construct, a lot of your decisions are informed by a fear of of Correct. godly retribution, and God will not approve of this. God told me to do this, told me not to do that, and I'll tell you this much: when you're from Oklahoma or Arkansas, like in the South, um, moving to LA to pursue a dream or oh. New York is you might as well go to Mars. It's like, Mom, I want to go to Mars, and so. For me, your, your your dad grew up in that era and circumstances yes. where he was given, ironically, the God given talent Correct. to do something, yeah. yet the framework of society. And I talk a lot about the internet. You and I are also very fortunate that we're in the primes of our careers with a yeah. scaled internet. I think I would be remarkable in any generation. You know, one of my favorite things right now is a bunch of fake entrepreneurs running around saying that 
they can't be as successful because of Biden. And I'm laughing. Like literally I'm like, I was successful during Clinton. I was successful yeah, during yeah. Bush. I was successful yeah. during Obama. I was successful during yeah. Trump. I'll be successful during Biden. Like yeah. real entrepreneurs win regardless. Like, 100%. you know, but I also know that the internet really enables more scale. Yes. Um, yeah. And so yeah. I, I just think about timing and things of that nature. So that was always in the backdrop for you, which probably do you, you know, could have worked either way, depending on your makeup and your parenting, could have made you also scared or gave you that, you had that spring in your step. That's what it gave me. It gave me the spring in the step. Real, I was, real quick, I apologize. You said that baby face and all that hit your radar, yet your dad was doing it. Did you know what your dad was doing? Did, I didn't did know. It? No, so he was, he was doing it by the time that I was cognizant of what my, my father was doing, he was selling like jewelry and what he was the guy, like if you're trying to get that hard to get Rolex or Patek. Was it as, was, Ryan, was it as extreme as you genuinely didn't know and then said to your dad, there's a guy baby facing, he's like, I did this. Or you kind of knew in the backdrop because it's your dad, you don't really put the two and two together. I didn't connect it. I I um I knew that my dad, see my dad was in a group in the 70s. So I knew that he was writing gospel, but under the framework of his own group. They were called World Action Singers, Living Sound. They Gospel blew up in the 70s. You had, you had Bob Dylan yeah, doing gospel yeah. records, Leon yeah. Russell, right? Yeah. And, and, um, so my dad was doing records with the lot, like guys like Leon Russell, a lot of these LA session players and, but under the framework of his own band. So I still didn't connect that He was writing for other people. And I thought that anytime an artist sang a song that they didn't write, that it was a cover song that they were covering someone else's previous hit, like in the seventies when Chris Christopherson would write something yeah. and covered. So I didn't connect it. And then I ended up going to I know I wanted to go into entertainment. I knew I wanted to create. I knew 100%. I had a I had a full ride scholarship for acting, which I didn't take. And I've been playing piano since I was three. Started writing songs at 15, and all of a sudden, around age 17, I had I wrote a couple songs that, to my ear, were as good as what was on the radio. And that's what I was aiming for. Like I'm going to quietly workshop this stuff until I'm good enough. To where the moment I step on stage, everyone's going to go, where the hell would that guy come from? So I want a record deal at 19, 20 years old on MTV, um, on TRL. And get this, didn't tell my mom I was going to New York. Didn't tell my family I was going to New York. None of my college roommates. Nobody knew that MTV was flying me to New York to play a song that I wrote by myself in my dorm room. And all of a sudden, my whole family finds out that I can sing, write, and perform all in the same day on TRL. And I Get won the that. fuck out of here. Yeah. What year? What year was that? 2000, 2000, 2000, 2001. So really, in the like towards the like tail end of the super hype of TRL. Correct. It, it was the peak of TRL. Like if it I could, peak I, of it. it was the peak of it because I was on TRL. This is when Carson was on there, or or yep. he, he it Carson was, was, and Diddy was Carson. coming in every day and just correct, correct. It was the epicenter of culture, dude. When I pulled up in Times Square, because a year before. I went to New York a year before, almost to the day. I went to New York with a friend of mine, crashed to my uncle's church down in the Lower East Side, went and hung out in Times Square. I got plucked out of the crowd to be on TRL. They wanted me just like sitting in front of the camera and to introduce the number one video. And Dave Holmes or Carson, whoever it was, pulls me over to, to, to drop a pin in when this was. He pulls me over to um, to like introduce number one and he goes, he goes, we got a brand new number one this week from a brand new single and a, a big debut for a new artist. We think she's going to be huge. Ryan, can you can you intro, intro it? And I go, well, following to number two this week is The Offspring, um, which was, uh, you know, I'm pretty yeah. flat for a white guy. You mm -hmm. know, uh, Give It To Me Baby or whatever that song was, right? And I go, and the new number one debut uh, video for TRL this week, da -da 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 -da, Britney Spears, Hit Me Baby One More Time. That clip exists? That clip exists, yeah. That? <laughs> <laughs> that was the year before. And so then a year later, I end up on TRL and I InSync was at its peak. TRL was at its peak. And then um, I win the record deal. Timbaland is watching this show. He happens to watch this episode. My record deal doesn't really mat uh, matriculate into much of anything. Over the course of the next year, I'm flown to Nashville, LA, New York, Nashville. And Timbaland calls me. I moved, moved to uh, New York upon graduation. I'm living in Hoboken and uh, this group in Atlantic Records is trying to, to sign me to be a part of the group. Once I realized that this is not a band, it's a boy band. I was like, peace, I'm out. 
Um, Timberlake actually was the one who told me I've known Justin since we were both whatever 20. And he's like, yeah, yo, dude, you don't want to do that, man. Boy bands are going out, bro. You want to get out. So <laughs> I peaked out. Dude, your, was, J, your JT voice is much stronger. That was really no, well done, dude. It's not bad, bro. It's not bad. Um, <laughs> so then I go to Nashville. One day I get a phone call from a, from a Virginia beach number, 757. I still remember the number and it's Timbaland who at the time, at the time, Biggest what? writer producer alive by a landslide. You ready okay? for this? This is just like how I love life. Yeah. Look at this. Look at my latest. <laughs> <laughs> Two missed calls. Is that all time? That's is incredible. That, there it is. Like life, how funny life is. Keep going. There it is. Small, full circle, right? So, so yeah. So he he ends up he ends up calling me. So he's a yo, dude. I saw I saw that show on TRL, man. He's like, man, you tight, you tight, bro, you tight, you know. So he flies me to New York, Manhattan Center Studios. And he's working at the time with like debate, like uh, who Birdman and whoever else. And I signed with Timbaland for two years. I followed Timbaland around the America. I moved to Miami. I'm with Timbaland, living in his apartment in Aventura, um, crashing on his bus. I'm with Scott Storch. He is. I was with him the day he wrote "Cry Me a River" the demo. I mean, he came in the bus. He said, "Brian, get in my bus." And like he comes in and plays me the demo. And I was like, "That's a yo, what?" Like I couldn't even understand it. I was there for the, you know, Future Set Love Sounds, that whole album, Sexy Back, Nelly Furtado, Missy Elliott, the first uh, session I had with him in Dallas. I remember Missy Elliott was there, Usher was there, JT was there, and they did, um, if they're on a dip it down, yeah, you know, like, like, is it worth it? Let me work it. Put your thing down, flip it and reverse it. And so I watched him at his creative Key. genius, like Apex, Key. changing culture, and I took that and about a year and a half later, I got my first cut with Bubba Sparks and about a year and a half into working with Tim, I was in Colorado for Christmas, whatever, hanging out, pulled up my MPC, sat down. I was like, well, I got to write my own stuff. And like pretty much the first thing I wrote was apologize. And I had Tim's drums because I had a bunch of Timbaland sounds and I just made up like threw the piano down. And then you go, oh, it, that sounds like a band. I think I'll call it Republic. And then it became One Republic. And that's kind of the the, the five minute synopsis on that whole journey from TRL to One Republic. And we were the last band, along with Paramore, to play TRL before they turned the lights off, which I thought was really kind of symbolic. Boring. Yeah, yeah. When I introduced you just introduced you just now and said entrepreneur. How did that land in your own mind? You're like, oh, Gary's being nice. Oh, he's right. Or it's cool that Gary sees me that way. Or it's it, it's neat that he sees that. Or yes, I am. Or I can't wait to do more. Like, how did that land? I, probably a little bit of all the above. Um, I'm so used to being introed as a songwriter, but ultimately, or an artist. But that is an entrepreneur. You're 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 manufacturing something out of nothing, figuring out where culture sits with what you're creating, finding that true market fit. Of your record, and the reason I got into entrepreneurship, funny enough, that the 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 degree that I was pursuing initially in college was a uh, entrepreneurship degree, um, and for, I just like creating things, man. And, and and you said something really interesting thing a minute ago. You said, you know, the connection between writing a hit record or a hit TV show or whatever, and the parallels between investing in something or creating something, creating a brand or a company that also resonates with the world. They're so similar. Bro, I'm blown away. I mean, we, we've talked about this off screen. Like one of the most flattering things ever to me was pro ever, because I have so much admiration for you. In my career was maybe 18 months ago when we started talking more often and you're hitting me up of like, hey Gary, your music understand, like you know these yeah. people, like, yeah. it, like about, you know, I've always- yeah, just it to me, the baby and TikTok yep. and Supreme or Kith yep. or 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 Bushwick or it's Dumbo real estate. It's all I just play one game of and I see something before somebody else sees it because I understand human beings. Dude, that is my whole game right now. I I started investing um Years ago, uh, in you know, alongside Guy Osiri and Ashton initially, mm -hmm. Abe Burns, who ran that mm -hmm. investments, became my homie. Then Paul Walker got connected with a lot of the different kind of like forecasting minds in Los Angeles, and and obviously not you know goes without saying you in New York and picking things, investing in things that to me 
I use myself as a litmus test, as a barometer. If I like something, I see so much shit around the world, traveling around the world, 300,000 miles a year. I see stuff popping off in Madrid, New Zealand, Sydney, Hong Kong. And when you are constantly injecting yourself into global culture. Listening. you s- Listening, tapping in and paying attention. Inevitably, 20% of the comments on this YouTube video are gonna be like, Gary, stop being a dick. Ryan has so much good to say, stop interrupting him. <laughs> and, and I always think about him like, my God, I'm so hyper listening, so intuitive. I know what the person's gonna say. I know that this is over in 22 minutes. I wanna get to so much shit. I yep. knew what he was gonna say, but I'm, a, I'm not the greatest interviewer because I need to mature in my life in making sure the full audience, know, like I already know what you're gonna say. So I'm yeah. like, cool, boom, quit, you know, the way we would eat dinner. But meanwhile, there's other people listening like, no, no, I wanted Ryan to finish that thought. I'm like, you did, you, what, you didn't understand what the thought was? It was it, you know, like, and so yes, it's listening. It, it's listening, dude, it's listening. And then what happens is, you for anybody watching it, starting a company, wanting to invest in startups, seed funding, whatever you're doing, it's listening, paying attention. Um, you know, my dad would always say the eleventh commandment in in the Bible is "Thou shalt not bullshit thyself." So <laughs> that's the eleventh commandment. Don't bullshit uh, yourself. Don't just because your mom likes awareness. it. Awareness. Your your mom likes it. Your girlfriend likes it. Cool. We're talking about the world liking it. And I think being real and honest, being your own worst critics, you're not being judged in the in the court of public opinion, but you're you're really critically thinking when you put something together. And then I think, like you said, Gary, it's it's listening and finding that thing. Here's one clue for me. If I keep complaining about something and I'm not a big complainer, I don't like complainers. I don't like people who complain and then don't provide a solution. Don't my whole team that works with me knows don't come at me with a problem if you don't have, you know, and I want you to have at least a hypothesis of a solution, a hypothesis. Don't just go boom and then walk out of the room. Um, so for me, it's like if I find myself being irritated about the lack of this or I, man, I wish this existed. I wish this thing, whatever. Once I do that enough, that's Scratch that's my time. Scratch I go, I go. Wait a minute. Is that why you're creating more products these days? I know that like it feel like yeah. every. I feel like every hundred days I get a text from you like, dude, <laughs> need to talk to you in a week. I got so, like, and, that, and that fires me up. Yeah, I'll give you. I mean, you already know about. I've been in. You know. Uh, the CBD water thing. I found CBD as an as an as a much needed panacea for stress. I'd gone through a really bad patch in 2017, 16 of just I had worked it too hard. I found the wall. I hit it, burned it at both. Pick your analogy. Burnt it at both ends. Didn't like uh, Xanax. Didn't like wanting to be on drugs at all. Um, discovered CBD. My 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 high school guys that I graduated high school with started Charlotte's Web, which mm. is the, you know, the largest mm. CBD companies in the world. They, they gave me the medical shakedown on it. I fell in love. I, I'm a true believer. So I got into the space, you know, um, and I didn't like how it tasted. I didn't, I mean, I'll give you just two quick yeah, examples. Go, I, didn't like, I didn't like how CBD tasted. I didn't like the, the medicinal plant flavor. And then I also, at the same time, crush a lot of coffee, don't drink enough water. And I thought, what if you took CBD, everybody's on functional beverages, made it taste good, Add it with water. Did did the whole Tom shoes give back? You know, one for one. Mm-hmm. Like have a social imperative buying your company. That's another thing. Don't just be a profit monster. Have a social imperative. Um, Ryan, can and, I ask you something about that? I apologize. Yeah, yeah. How do you think about that? Because I I think that there's two ways to do that, right? Like like I when empathy came out, correct? Wine, right. So many people in my inner circle debated like, fuck the name. Let's do the Tom shoes. Let's do the give back. And I'm like, look, I give back all the time. We're gonna give back. I don't think, you know, sometimes if it's not fully authentic to your- No, it has to be authentic. If you're gonna do it, yeah, there's a caveat to that. If you're going to do it, there are certain brands, like, I mean, to be quite honest, Gary, with with empathy, I don't know what I would do as a gift. That's not, that's a weird one. You know what the cool thing is with that one, with such a broad name, you could have picked anything because being empathetic to any group of people would have allowed the permission. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, were you to start the brand right now, I have a feeling you'd probably find an affiliation. You know what's funny though? I wouldn't because I feel like right now, and my my mind changes all the time. Right now, I feel like those are forced. Yep. And like, I'm very happy about my give back initiatives. I also am pretty private about my, you know, much like I'm with my personal life, I'm very yep. private with my give back. I've gotten a little louder with like, you know, Pencils of Promise and yep. Charity Water, things I'm on the boards of, but um, so boom, think- and you made it. I think I think it's. I think, I think it's give a quick plug because I, yeah, I cut it off because I was curious. I wanted people. I was. I have. We have so many young people listening who are yeah. putting businesses together, and I want to yeah. make sure that they felt that they didn't have to do the give no. one back when you know. Yeah. 
You don't have to. It has to be authentic to you. For me, Adele's husband, Simon Konecki, ex-husband, was a friend of mine. He ran a nonprofit called Drop for Drop, which is functional mm -hmm. to Tom Schuster's opponent. Blake Mykoski is mm -hmm. an advisor. Like super well. just, Blake is joining the board of Mad Tasty. Walter Robb, a Whole Foods CEO, joining the board. How, 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 long, how long have you been doing Mad Tasty? I've been talking a lot about Mad Tasty over the last three months. Um, We've been around for about a year. There it is. There's the unicorn tears. That's one of the flavors. I'm actually cru and then I'm actually drinking this one right now. Watermelon kiwi. So it's 20 milligrams CBD, all natural, um, five calories, and we 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 are building our seventh well right now in India, and we're building another one in Malawi. And so what we do is every you know, we we donate 12 ounces of drinking water. So we you if you buy a can, we we donate 12 ounces. What the equivalent is we build clean water wells. Because that is a, a huge epidemic. Is Are you kidding? I mean, charity water has been literally the yep. most. The yep. thing I've been. I mean, it's unbelievable when you get educated on how many people around the world don't have fresh water. Dude, it's crazy. People are dying from diarrhea. Kids, like thousands, millions. Like it's insane. So, so that this is taken off. We're up. You know, to give you hard numbers. We're up seventy percent this quarter from last quarter, and hundred percent from the quarter before. It's taking off. Uh, the FDA regulation with CBD is tricky. Let, so let me let me let me let me ask you a quick question. That while you were talking, I was trying to let you talk, so I didn't yeah. interrupt, but I felt it. I I took everything I had to not jump in. I have a question. I'm dying to know, and I'm sure it will be a fun story. Yeah. So you and I are fortunate. We have this intuition of the consumer. Yeah. From a music standpoint. Where have you been crazy off? What record did you hear? Mm -hmm. And you're like, this is, nah, I don't not see. Not gonna happen. Not gonna happen. And then went and slayed America or artist where yep. you're like, not on, not on some like guessing shit on like you sat, yep. you looked because we've all been there, right? <laughs> I, I passed on Airbnb, I passed on Uber. Like, where did you, where did you, where did you uh, really miss it? Um, I really miss it. So every year, there's one or two records that I'm completely off on. Like every year, we, and songwriters have this conversation all the time. Like we pride ourselves in guessing, oh, that's a hit. That's not a hit. That of course, is. of course, of course. Um, I was wildly off on, and it's the biggest record of this past year by a landslide. I was wildly off on Blinding Lights, The Weeknd. Um, Interesting. By the way, everybody was. Like in the, and everybody, don't get me wrong. I love the song. Not not throwing shade of the weekend. I love Abel. You didn't th uh, you didn't think you didn't think the audience was gonna get it. Nobody did. Nobody. Did. I mean, it, it, why was it too complex? This song has been brought up, and it was written by a couple of my friends, like so the, one of the best pop songwriters of all time, Max Martin, um, and Abel, because when it came, the first single they dropped didn't connect. It was the fastest fall in the Hot 100 history. Is and, that true? Yeah, that's true. And which um, one, Starbuck or? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, there was a record. I don't even remember the name of it, but they dropped hey, it. Keep going. And I think it was in a car commercial. No, then they got lining lights. Anyway, so this is back at the beginning of the pandemic. Now they dropped it right before the pandemic. So there's only about two or three artists that had momentum going into the pandemic. Those two or three artists maintained and kept that momentum for the last nine months. Dua Lipa. Yeah, and there was a weird chart freezing situation that happened. There was three or four months where I swear to God, the top 10 in Spotify didn't move by more than two songs because they just, they just froze, right? What's All the Uber drivers went home. People weren't going through their playlists. It just, everyone's watching the news. They weren't, there wasn't that much, you know, chart movement. The Weeknd got the benefit of that. A handful of records, Dua Lipa got the benefit of that. Mm. Um, but The Weeknd Blinding Lights, I think if you asked Abel himself, did you think it was as big as it is, he would start laughing. I know, I know for a fact the label didn't think that. Nobody, when you're in songwriting sessions, that song gets brought up a lot lately because everyone has the same response. They go, did you see that coming? Nobody saw that coming. And it is the single biggest streaming hit it will go down it'll break every single record within the next 90 days streaming records it's going to pass ed sharon what do you think, right what do you think about tiktok's impact on the top tiktok so um i'm you know friends with a lot of people who are having some some massive success in tiktok right now my friend jay cash who i spoke with yesterday wrote savage love for derulo derulo i'm very tight with i just did a record with him a week ago we're having conversations he um his he, career, his career has been completely rekindled by that platform. He has bodied TikTok. You caught, you saw TikTok come in. I mean, I believe I from day one, I knew that this was going to be a huge mover. Um, oh, from, I, a, from a from a mainstream, he is the Khaled, Khaled was Snap. Yep, yep, yep. There, Ashton, dude, Ashton was Twitter. Come on, take it Move twenty four karat golden, right? I'm about to with, with that dude, Ian Dior. That is a that record was written with TikTok in mind. Right. Bro, this is the weirdest, weirdest day. This interview is all time. Hold on one second. <laughs> I just got to show you this. 
Synchronicity. Synchronicity. When I tell you, like. Yo, what's good, Gary? It's 24K going here. And uh, I got a question for you today, right? Yep. So, already- Is that just so crazy? You Not and I surprised. are very much on the same wave. Not surprised, dude. We're on the same wave. I'm going in with with uh, Blake Slack and that the whole crew that's that's part of the Ian mm-hmm. York the Golden Crew. Um, been working with Kid Leroy a bunch. Um, look, the TikTok thing in the last. So I did an analysis about six months ago, five months ago. Um, in the top 20, 16 of the top 20 songs had gone off on TikTok. Yeah. So here's the, here's the upside. I'm gonna talk on TikTok for 30 seconds, then I'll go, go off. The upside, the downside, and where I where I personally think might happen with TikTok. Number one, the upside is um, it's removed barrier to entry. It's it's gate crashed the the festival that is streaming and radio and Spotify. Um, and so artists at this point who might not have had a shot like Josh six eighty five from New Zealand. He's a seventeen year old high school kid in New Zealand, and he's going to make probably five million bucks off Savage Love. That's the truth. Probably more. Um, and so everyone's like, oh, I got to write songs. You can't game TikTok. You can pay the top. 10 or 20 people to dance to your record, but ultimately they have created it in such a way that they actually, if they think a record label is gaming it, they'll kill it. They'll kill that virality. So it truly is a direct reflection of culture. Now here's, that's the, that's the positive thing about TikTok. Here's the negative thing. The best song doesn't win, right? Historically, my whole career, and I'm quoting two record label executives right now that, that I've heard in the last month say the same thing. Historically, the, you could always say no matter what happens or what weird fad is going on, guys, the best song still wins. With TikTok, that's not the case. You have it, – it isn't so much to do with the record itself. It reminds me of the ringtone moment, moment in the early 2000s when you had Happy Frog and these different songs popping off. It's not about the best song. It is about the dance, the virality, the culture attached to it. All but these one, different- one, one could argue – I mean, not only could one argue, I can't believe what just happened. I literally – had, I've literally heard what you just said before in my life when the original manager of the Sticks was talking to me about MTV. Yep. He said what MTV did was ruined it because the best records didn't win anymore. Yeah, I don't think TikTok's ruined it. I no, think no, I'm, I'm, yeah. but just stick with me here because this is a super yeah. interesting moment. One could argue what TikTok is right now is what MTV was in the mid eighties that threw the entire thing for a loop, which is when you added the visual element and you added the fact that every teenager was in one place, the best song got redefined because ultimately the only person, not you, not me, not the executives, not, not the academies, the consumer wins. And if the consumer's attention is in a certain place and they're added variables of the full pledged artistry, whether that's Charlie D'Amelio, 24 goal, whatever it is, Yep. It is. The market yeah. is always right. Yep. I, I would if you could change the change the change the um, definition, right? What I would say to that is, um, the most consumed song wins. The most the most engaging song based on visual and or song and or artist wins. Um, we, the kind of the the analogy that someone was saying is, do you think Adele Rolling in the Deep? right? One of the, one of the biggest, most iconic records of the last decade or longer would rolling in the deep go off in the age of TikTok in 2020. Yeah, so but one, but one, one could argue that the greatest songs that we all know in the fifties and sixties, if they didn't pay the, the radio right. disc jockeys, to, right. I would argue that this game has always been the case and that the relationship of distribution and who does or doesn't control it at that moment or how controlled or uncontrolled is it yeah. is a huge variable. You being an entrepreneur, for example, you dropped it very lightly already in here. We've never really talked about this, but I've this is why I've always desperately admired you from afar. And again, I mentioned it earlier, Aton Sugarman, a great friend of both of ours, a great, great friend. Yep. Um, you know, really was like the person I most, you know, I knew of you, but like just to talk about the quality of who you were. So like, you know, to me, if like someone's a nice person and hardworking, like I'm already on third and a half base with that. <laughs> um, but like you talked about earlier about the song in a commercial. Yeah. You know, yeah. your ability to be an entrepreneur, in my opinion, from afar and think about things like a commercial. Yeah. Which is hugely financially val- valuable yep. and distribution for awareness. Yep. Yep. I, mean, I always talk about it. I call it the good Charlotte rule. <clears throat> good Charlotte on Madden, on repeat, when people were doing franchise mode in those early days, really mattered. I think about distribution all the time. Yep. I would argue that Adele's song is remarkable, remarkable, and was in the right place at the right time for distribution. Right. And that had it been 20 years earlier, 
I have a funny feeling Adele's song would not win in 1999 TRL land because she didn't look the part to a lot of people. Yep, you're, you're correct. Timing, right? so, I mean, dude, timing is every timing is everything. So Think here we go, how right? How big NSYNC was. How big NSYNC was. If you brought out five dudes right now that are American. Five white were, dudes. Not going to happen. Right? To, Amer to America. Five white yeah. guys to America yeah. right now. Yeah. Probably not going to be the moment. Uh, about the least wavy thing you could do right now is put a five-piece white group together. Or, or maybe the counter move is the other way. And maybe it does. Like, it, this is what I love about the market. Being, yeah. The market yeah. being the judgment. I think all that TikTok is doing is getting the same points of view from the establishment yep. Yep. that has always happened always. Whether yep. it was Soul Train and Dick Clark and, and Casey Kasin, whether it was MTV, whether then it was YouTube and Viva, whether it was Spotify, whether it's like, there will always be a new variable that comes and is more consumer centric. Yes. And then whoever is adaptive to that consumer centricality is mm -hmm. gonna win, and then whoever's not is gonna say, this isn't real music. It's, this 100%. rap is not real. This, well, the, Duran Duran sucks. That's not, like, could you, I mean, yeah. you, you, this is your world. Yeah. I couldn't even imagine what the real bands of the late 70s and early 80s. Oh my God. I mean, <laughs> this is why I brought up the stick story, because yeah. when I found this gentleman in a different meeting, I yeah. grilled him for an hour and a half, because my thought of what the clash what fucking you know led zeppelin and yeah. like 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 acdc thought when duran yeah. duran and twisted sister and rat yeah. took over because they were mtv centric yep yep you're 100 right i mean look i produced the last two u2 albums i've produced the killers i work with a lot of bands i'm working with bastille right now it, <clears throat> it's a weird time in general for bands it's a weird time for bands it's a weird time for bands you know coldplay biggest band in the world dropped a double album earlier this year and a lot of people don't even know what happened. And they're one of the biggest bands in the world. I it's didn't. Just, I didn't. And I'm a and I'm an enormous fan of their sound. Yeah, there you and go. I pay attention like a motherfucker. No yeah. clue. No clue. I just told you. Now you're gonna go online. You're gonna go. Holy shit! There's there's two albums here. You know what's so, so funny about zigzagging? It makes me want to start a band. Yeah. Like to me I, right now, the opportunity to build like the monster yeah, band feels yeah. real. Sonically, that's where it's headed. So I I, I can't. What like, does that mean? The demos. So. Things happen musically, right? right. The, the musical trends come out before, the, you know, the beauty of what I do or one of the thing, things, that, reasons I consider myself lucky is I get to hear where the world's going to be at nine months from now. And it comes, it starts with the song in the studio that's, that's, mm -hmm. that is capturing current culture, but talking about other stuff. And you get to hear those records mm -hmm. like six to nine months before they come out. So like, you can kind of, it's a, it's a bit of a Nostradamus lens. I see it. And you're saying if you listen, it's kind of like how I felt about tech or what I do with influencers. Yeah. You're saying, yeah. it, the, so I'm yelling a lot about men's makeup. Yep. Like I've, I've said for about 18 months now, if I was to start a company from scratch right now and I yep. had to do it, I couldn't do Vayner anymore and my yep. model, I would start a men's makeup brand. And it's coming because I already see it because yep. I see it broad enough back to New Zealand, e-boys, yes. da-da-da. You're yeah. saying, because you listen to so many things that are coming, you're like, wait a minute, the, and then if you're good at this game, yes. oh, look what's happening. Yes. From this hip hop artist to this band, to this yep. pop girl, they're all, there's something's happening here and it's this thing. So to that point, I've heard some demos from some people we've already mentioned on this, on this <laughs> interview yeah. and from some other huge artists that are in that space and everything, is leaning band. It is going this, sonically. I heard a record last week from a guy that um is just now popping off in LA, like under like way off the radar, but but I think very probably. Yep. And it was basically, it was it was literally Blink One Eighty Two. I mean, it was a it was like it was somewhere between Blink One Eighty Two and Good Charlotte, and like throwing. Love, the, it's so early. obvious that that can yeah. happen right That's now. That's where it. Listen to the instrumentation. Listen to circles. Post Malone. There's a there's a forecast. hundred oh, percent. That's a wave, right? That's a wave. That's not just a one off song. You're gonna have whole bands and artists that started because of one song. Circles. Little, little rapid fire. Underrated. Who's the most underrated artist in your subjective opinion right now? Or if you know, I know it's a tough wow. question. Like, or, or you can name one or two. Just who's right now in your opinion fairly new, just underrated right now. Fairly new, underrated artist. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's a great question. Or, or they don't even have to be fairly new. Maybe they're actually very big and you're actually like, man, people think this person made it. Wait till they see the next decade of her or his or their yeah. uh, potential. 
Um, I mean, that is such a good question. I think that, I think that, uh, I mean, Post is already so big. I'm the, a lot of the artists that I work with are. are well, let's talk about that. Like big. Post, actually, it's funny. I think I asked asked the question because you said Post. I actually think yeah. Post has the potential to be underrated because yes. I, I I actually believe that. Yeah, I agree. I so I would, and, and anybody that works with him would tell you the same thing. I think That's Post right. is underrated. You go, why he's so big? He's so big. Da 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 da. Yeah, he he is so, truly though. Beyonce, a freak Beyonce, Beyonce and Drake were so big and were yeah. underrated and went on to become bigger. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Sway Lee. Uh, look, Sway Lee is one of the most freak of nature talents, melody contrivers in the world. The guy can, the guy will come up with melodies and phrases that reminds me of when Tricky in the Dream created Rihanna Umbrella. And the mm. first time anyone heard that, Ella, oh, Ella, that a, a, like that was, that started a whole wave. Right. And he, Sway Lee has that ability. He has that talent. Sway Lee, if he connects the dots, could be one of the absolute biggest pop artists that, that, that are around. So Sway Lee, you feel, has the ingredients. He just has to cook it. Correct. He has to cook it. Um, Which is hard. By yeah, the way, everybody hard. who's listening right now, when I talk about this in sports, in entrepreneurship, in music, in acting, in, in, uh, in being a CFO of a company, I have watched in my young, I turned 45 this Saturday, in my young 45 years, I've seen so many people that had every ingredient but couldn't get out of their ways of insecurity, ego, yep. uh, lack of work ethic, uh, lack uh, serendipity, a tragic yep. event in their family didn't let them get there. Uh, in sports, you see people get hurt. There, there, there's yep. different things. And yo, team. So who your team is, it is such a limited group of people that can that can absolutely displace you or influence you positively in, in your career. And if you have, if someone in your team isn't firing on all cylinders, they can, whether knowingly or unknowingly, completely sabotage your future with whatever that is. Like a Music, band. company, yeah, like a band, dude. You got a band, you got a bad manager. I went through a handful of managers before we landed with the one that I have now. I have the same manager of Pharrell and um Usher and a handful of others. He's brilliant, one of the best in the business, Ron Lafitte. It took me three or four chapters of managers to and get literally right. getting dropped by Columbia Records. I've been dropped twice, you know, like it took all that to, for me to land the right manager. And I learned the lesson of who your team is, is everything. It's absolutely everything. It's critical. So yeah, I think, I think Swaley's un underrated. Taylor Swift, as big as she is, nobody's been in the studio with her. Like they haven't seen what, like I've seen her, her, her actual innate ability um, exceeds just about any human being that I've ever, ever seen. Uh, it, she's, she is the best, like, solo writer that's that's recording music right now she can sit down and do a whole thing by herself it's phenomenal um the single greatest musician in the world now i don't know if, if you consider this person underrated or overrated i just don't think he's talked about enough i think he's ad admired but the single most impressed i've ever been musically um by anyone is stevie wonder he is mm. there's no one alive no one alive that is he is the physical embodiment of music period i would i would argue that he's he's uncomfortably underrated, uncomfortably. Okay, there you and go. I'll, I'll tell you why, I would, I, I, you know, I, maybe the reason I just asked you this to wrap up, cause I gotta run, I'm sure you do as well. I, uh, I did this little, you know, Instagram TikTok show called Overrated Underrated. Yep. And I don't know the questions and my team just blurts out stuff and it's- Yeah, I thought, I thought that was what we were doing. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, it's funny. Like, and anyway, I said the Beatles were underrated and the comments exploded. They're like, how you're is the- right? No, you're Herbson right. But I think they are. I don't think I think I think most people under 35 struggle to understand it in context as they should because I understand who's going to do the homework. Yep. I think Stevie Wonder Stevie Wonder was winning at 10. Yeah, winning at 10. At 10. He, I just he want everybody to hear that. I just he, want, hold on real quick. Yeah. I apologize, Ryan. 10. Most of you have a 10-year-old yep. in your life, yours, your brother, your sister. 10, 10, one of the biggest stars in the world at yep. 10. Yep. And the only artist to win back-to-back -back, uh, best album Grammys within two, within a year of each other. He did two albums in a row. One, grand, you know, album of the year two years in a row. The man is the single most talented musician alive. I've put my name on it. Paul McCartney. I produced his last album. We had a, we had the first number one Paul McCartney album in thirty five years, and I watched McCartney jump around his studio in England playing every instrument. Which, by the way, they were the instruments from 
Sergeant Pepper. He has all of them still there. That's what he uses. And I watched him, I watched him bounce around. I go, Paul, get on the drums. And I hit record. And then he'd do the drum solo. Paul, get on piano, get on the harpsichord. It's fucking amazing. The man is 74 and he bounced around for five days playing everything. It was, it was like, I mean, that's the, the you know. You know what, Brian? I'm going to end with that. How old are you? Uh, I'm 41. Great. Brian's 41. I turned 45, like I said, on November 14th, depending on when you're listening to this. Paul McCartney, 74 still doing it. When you find what you do, what you love, when you're at it, for all you 20 fucking year olds that listen to this shit and get mad at me when I talk about patience, it's early. Oh my Brian, God. What were, you, what were you doing when you were 22 years old? When I was 22 years old, I was living in Nashville, writing songs, signed to Timbaland, trying, uh, absolutely broke. I was broke until I was 20, 26, absolutely flat broke. <laughs> and by the way, for everybody to understand this, one of the like one of the great talents, and of course, there's going to be people in their 20s like Ryan that get there. I'll use myself at 26. I didn't have fun anything about anything about anything other than I was building a liquor store for my dad's business. Like yeah. I was building a business for him. So I think that patience matters. And when I hear the 74 year old story of McCartney, yeah. like that fucking fires me up. This was a lot of fun, Ryan. I love you. I wish Dude, you well. Thank you, Gary. Peace. Thank you, Seth, for producing. We'll talk soon. Bye, everyone. Leave some comments. YouTube Botcher, what's up? It's Gary V. First of all, thank you so much. I hope you're doing super well during these times. Uh, I also want to ask you, please subscribe because my commitment and exploration of YouTube is about to explode. Stories, polls, more content, more engagement, more surprise and delight. This is the time to subscribe. I hope you consider it, and I hope I see you soon.